Chemistry lecture number 28, history of the periodic chart. In the late 18s, in the late 1790s, Lavoisier compiled a list of uh, 23 known elements. By 1870, there were 70 known elements. Chemists began to notice that some elements had similar properties and could be grouped by their properties. They also noticed that there was a pattern to the groupings. In 1829, uh, Johann Doberreiner placed elements into groups by their chemical properties. Each group had three members. He called these groups triads. And here are some of the uh, triads he created. Lithium, sodium, and potassium. Uh, form one trion, calcium, strontium, and barium, another triad, uh, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, another triad, and chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So if they fall in the same vertical column, they share similar chemical properties. For example, lithium, sodium, and potassium, uh, these elements are soft metals. Uh, they all react with water to make an alkaline solution. An alkaline solution tastes bitter and it feels slippery. Calcium, strontium, and barium, uh, these elements react with hot water to make an alkaline solution. Uh, they also conduct electricity better than uh, lithium, sodium, and potassium. Sulfur, selenium, and tellurium, these elements all combine with hydrogen to make acidic substances. And chlorine, bromine, and iodine, these elements all react with metals uh, to form compounds similar to salt. Doberreiner also noticed that the atomic mass of the second element in a group is close to the average of the first and third elements. So here's one triad, lithium, sodium, and potassium. If you notice, sodium has an average atomic mass of 22.99 atomic mass units. But if you take the first one and the third one and take the average of these two, 6.941 and then 39.0928, if you take the average of the first and third, you get a number which is very close to the actual uh, average atomic mass of the second one. And you can do these with uh, all the other ones. So if you were to take the average of calcium and barium, you'd get a number that's very close to the average atomic mass of strontium. And it works for all of these triads. Now, in 1864, John Newlands listed the elements from lightest to heaviest, and he noticed that chemical properties repeated with every eighth element. He called this property the law of octaves. So here are the elements listed from lightest to heaviest, and every eighth element the property repeated. So we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and this eighth element had similar properties to lithium. So we start counting again. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Potassium. Potassium had properties that are similar to sodium, which had properties that were similar to lithium. And then you would start all over again. So, lithium, sodium, and uh, potassium share similar properties. Uh, ca carbon and silicon are also similar. Notice that carbon is the fourth uh, element listed in the first group, and then silicon is the fourth element listed in the seventh group, well, they both share similar properties. Uh, fluorine and chlorine are also similar. Fluorine is the seventh element listed in the first group, and chlorine is the seventh element listed in the second set, and they share similar properties. So you can just keep doing this forever. Uh, boron and aluminum, beryllium and magnesium, and so on. They all share similar properties. In 1869, Dmitry Mendeleev also listed the elements in horizontal rows from lightest to heaviest. He started new rows when properties began to repeat. And he also spaced the elements so that elements and vertical columns shared similar properties. So here are the elements listed from lightest to heaviest, just like Newlands did. And then every time a property began to repeat, he would start a new row. So he went lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. And after fluorine is sodium, but sodium has properties similar to lithium, so we start a new row. And then we go sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine. And then after chlorine comes potassium. But the properties of potassium are similar to lithium and sodium, so we start a new row. And so on. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And then this row writes out the elements they knew about, potassium, calcium. And then after calcium comes arsenic, but he didn't place arsenic right here or here. Instead, he placed it over here because the properties of arsenic match those of phosphorus and nitrogen. And then we have silicon, I'm sorry, selenium, bromine. After bromine comes strontium, but he didn't place strontium here. The properties of strontium didn't match those of potassium, sodium, and lithium. So he placed it here because the properties of strontium do match those of calcium, magnesium, beryllium. And then indium, uh, tin, antimony, tellurium, iodine, and barium. And notice that barium is placed right here, not over here. Properties of barium match these elements here. So he placed them not only from lightest to heaviest, but he also placed them by the column so that it matched the properties of the elements above it. And notice that two of Dobreiner's triads appear on the first two vertical columns <clears throat> right here. Here's one triad, and then here's another triad, calcium, strontium, and barium. Set this one aside. Now spacing the elements so that they fit uh, into the correct vertical columns created gaps in the chart. If you look at the third horizontal column starting with K, there are two gaps between calcium and arsenic. So this horizontal column right here, these two gaps right here between calcium and arsenic. Um, they didn't have elements uh, to fill these little spots right here. All right, now Mendeleev believed that the blank spaces represented undiscovered elements. He correctly predicted the properties of gallium, germanium, and other elements before their discovery. So what Mendeleev said was, this spot right here is going to be some unknown element, and it's gonna have properties identical to those of aluminum and boron and indium, and he was even able to probably predict the average atomic mass. So he predicted the properties of gallium that parentheses, gallium slips in right there, uh, before gallium was uh, discovered. Likewise, he predicted that an element would fit right in here. It would have an atomic mass that was the average of these two, and he predict, probably predicted that uh, it might have been a semiconductor or something that didn't conduct electricity as well. In any case, uh, germanium goes right here. So before gallium and germanium were discovered, he was able to predict what properties each of these would have when they were discovered. Mendeleev's system was not perfect. Uh, listing elements from lightest to heaviest occasionally placed elements into the wrong vertical column. Now for example, iodine has an atomic mass of 126.7 atomic mass units, and tellurium has a mass of 127 atomic mass units. So let's write that down. Iodine has an atomic mass unit of 126.7 AMU, and then tellurium has an atomic mass unit of 127 AMU. Now if you look at their average atomic mass, iodine is lighter than tellurium, so iodine should actually go right here according to uh, Tler, uh, Mendeleev's system. But if you did that, uh, the properties would not match. The properties of iodine don't match those of oxygen, sulfur, and selenium. Likewise, if tellurium followed iodine, it wouldn't match the properties of fluorine, chlorine, and bromine. <clears throat> All right, so to repeat, Putting iodine into a column uh, before tellurium would put it with selenium, sulfur, and iodine. And iodine doesn't share the same properties as these elements. And likewise, tellurium's properties don't match those of bromine, chlorine, and fluorine. So putting tellurium over here wouldn't match these properties. And Mendeleev put tellurium and iodine in their correct columns and suggested that the atomic mass of tellurium had not been measured correctly. So what Mendeleev did was he said, all right, well, even though tellurium should go after iodine and should go into this one, I'm going to put it right here anyway, because I think that this number isn't correct. I think tellurium is lighter than what it was measured with. So he, I guess he blamed the uh, experimenters who uh, measured the mass of uh, tellurium and suggested that they did it wrong or didn't do it as precisely as they should have. Actually, uh, he was wrong. Tellurium was indeed heavier than iodine. So instead of listing the elements by atomic mass, uh, another method was needed. 
1914, Henry Moseley succeeded in using the X-ray spectra of elements to measure their atomic number. So they just zapped the elements with energy and they gave off X-rays, and the pattern of X-rays told them something about the atomic number. Well, actually, they were actually able to predict and measure the number of protons in the atom, the atomic number, by looking at the x-rays emitted when the elements were zapped with energy. All right, so elements can now be listed in order of their atomic number. Now, listed by atomic number, tellurium, atomic number 52, could now be listed before iodine, which had an atomic number of 53. So, iodine has an atomic number of 53, and then tellurium has an atomic number of 52. So done that way, tellurium would go in front of iodine in the chart. Then they would fit correctly in the correct order. So tellurium would now be placed below selenium, sulfur, and oxygen. So tellurium now goes there. And then likewise, iodine can now be placed below bromine, chlorine, and fluorine, like that because by atomic number, iodine would follow tellurium. See, iodine and tellurium were now in columns with other elements that shared the same chemical properties. The modern periodic chart now lists elements by their atomic number. For a PDF transcript of this lecture, go to www.richardlouis.com. This has been chemistry lecture number 28, history of the periodic chart.